is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. One of the most challenging factors for schools looking to improve is one that might be hardest for educators to control. In a deeply reported series for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Aaron Richards looks at student churn, how kids moving frequently among different schools can hinder their own learning and also impact the teachers and classmates they leave behind. She joins us today. Erin, welcome to EWA Radio. Thank you. Glad to be here. Why did you want to tell this story? I read the book Evicted in the fall of 2015 when it came out, and I was deeply moved by the fact that this eviction crisis was forcing so many families in Milwaukee to move. The one thing the book didn't explore was the impact that all of that movement was having on kids and the schools that they were attending. And because I've covered education for so long in this city, I thought maybe there's a lot more going on here that I have failed to fully realize. So I wanted to see what turnover was happening. And how long have you been on the city beat? I've covered education here for about a decade. Obviously, you had a lot of sources already, but this particular project required quite a bit of data. How difficult was it to get, and where did you start? So I started with Milwaukee Public Schools, and they had some data on mobility between schools. But we needed all the data for private schools that receive vouchers, and we needed data for the independent charter schools as well. And I turned to the state education department, which had started as part of a state law, a student information system for all kids that accept public funding, and that had been in place for two years. So that was the basis for where we started. To get student-level data from the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, I needed to team up with a researcher who had institutional research board approval to get student-level data, and then I could also get that data as a co-signer on that request. We also had an in-house data person who could look at the full spectrum of school switches between kindergarten and 12th grade. We never could have done this without seeing individual students, which usually were prohibited from getting. The agreement with the state allowed us to use that data, but we had to run what we were going to show past the state so they knew that we weren't breaking privacy laws. It was very difficult, but we knew we needed the data and we knew that we needed to crunch it to figure out if there was an impact on test scores. For folks who may not be familiar with how the Wisconsin school voucher system works, tell us a little bit about where those public dollars go and how popular the program is. There's about 100,000 kids under the age of 18 in Milwaukee, specifically. The district has about mm, 65 to 70,000 kids. The private schools that receive publicly funded vouchers, there are a little over 30,000 kids in that program. And there's another 8,000 or so children attending independent charter schools. What did you find out about how often Wisconsin students generally are changing schools? When we looked at the statewide data, the figure that we came across was about one in 10 kids in Wisconsin changes school in the course of a year. And we looked at a snapshot between the fall of 2016 and the fall of 2017 for all publicly funded students. In Milwaukee and other urban districts, that rate was way higher. So in Milwaukee, one in four kids is not staying with the same school all year. So about 25 percent turnover in the city. How does that compare nationally? It's hard to say because... Only about half of states even collect data on student turnover and then report it publicly. So we undertook the challenge of querying every state education department for the figures that they collected. And it's all over the map for individual school districts. Many track it very closely and some don't track it at all. So it was really hard to tell. Based on the states that we could collect data from, that 1 in 10 figure is pretty close. And there was a big national study a number of years ago by the Government Accountability Office that also pointed to about 1 in 10 kids overall. So we knew we were kind of close to the national average based on the figures that we could get. Given how much we know about how difficult it is for kids when they do change schools, I think it is sort of stunning that it's not tracked more closely. But I also feel like maybe this is a breakthrough topic in a way, the way that chronic absenteeism has come into the spotlight in the last five or six years or so, with more states paying closer attention. What do you think? I fully agree. We know that in education, the issues and items that get the most attention are the issues that are tracked with data. And part of the problem here is that there hasn't been a big emphasis on 
tracking the amount of turnover, especially because we know that a lot more turnover happens in low-performing schools, we just haven't made that a priority. And so it's very hard for some schools to even compare themselves to other schools to say, okay, you know, our scores are this, but we have this much turnover. That school is is this amount. It, for the most part, it's anecdotal. It's what teachers report and principals report. We could be doing a much better job of collecting this data because it's another flashlight into how, you know, what things are affecting families, what other issues may be impacting those lower test scores. What do researchers know about how this kind of turnover and churn impacts an individual student's academic path? A number of good studies show the impact that um, student mobility has on things like behavior infractions. The link to high school dropout rates is very strong when kids switch schools a lot at the high school level. There are some researchers that believe that poverty alone is responsible for lower test scores and turnover is just a factor of poverty. What I think is interesting that comes across in your story is this idea of parents taking advantage of these choice options with the hope, obviously, that their kid is going to go to a more successful school and have a better experience. But that's not necessarily the case, is it? This was one of our biggest aha moments, and it's only because we had two really good people crunching the data. A professor at the University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh, who I teamed up with to get the data, and then Kevin Crow, our data reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. What we found was that 75% of the kids leaving schools in Milwaukee were leaving a low-performing program, and more than half of them were simply transferring to another low-performing program. This is all judged by the state report cards. But we could show with data that what choice was designed to do, which is to help kids move to better-performing schools, it just wasn't happening here, that the amount of churn and negative impacts of this were predominantly impacting negatively the kids who are already the most behind and the most disadvantaged. You also found, of course, that this has an impact on the kids who don't go anywhere, who stay in their neighborhood school. Talk a little bit about that. One of the best studies on this is a 20-year-old study from David Kerbo. He looked at classrooms where there were lots of kids moving in and out, and then classrooms where most of the kids stayed put. And in both of those cases, he looked at staple students as well as the ones who moved. And even in the classrooms where lots of kids were moving, it wasn't just the movers who were negatively impacted. The pace of the class and the amount of curriculum that teachers could cover was simply slower in the classrooms with high turnover. And so that was where we really saw, man, you know, this impacts kids who are sticking around as well. If you're in a school with high churn, this could be a factor even for the kids who stay put. We're talking with Erin Richards about her reporting on student churn in Wisconsin. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Your support and feedback will help us grow. This week's episode is sponsored by the Eli and Edith Broad Foundation. The Broad Foundation believes in the power of public education, the potential of students, and the possibilities created by expanding learning opportunities for all children. Visit broadfoundation.org for more information. Erin, if you had to put a percentage on it, how much of this churn is being driven by the school choice options in Wisconsin versus outside factors like families having to move or relocate for financial reasons? We couldn't tell that specifically in Milwaukee because we didn't have a way to survey parents in a robust and meaningful way. What we do know from research is that residential changes and then just dissatisfaction with a school for some reason drive the majority of changes. And what we do know is that in Milwaukee, where there is so much choice, I mean, kids are very untethered from having to attend their neighborhood school. And what I found in interviewing a lot of parents in the community, parents whose voices don't get heard very much, a lot of them said, well, why wouldn't I try something new? There might be something better that I haven't found yet for my child. So switching schools wasn't seen at all as a negative to some families. It was simply seen as I'm constantly looking for something new. Other families would tell me that when they had a disagreement with a teacher or a principal, they knew that there was power in their child attending that school because there's dollars attached to that child. And so they would say, I'm taking my kid out. I'm going elsewhere. You want me and I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go somewhere else. And so I think for a lot of disenfranchised parents, this is also a way to exercise power. What do you mean by that? I mean that a lot of these parents 
are caught up in a web of a lot of other difficult life issues, evictions, joblessness, trying family situations. And so a lot of them don't have a lot of other power over what's happening in their lives. And being able to exercise where their kid goes to school, some parents would say that they knew that schools wanted them. They knew that they were a valuable commodity and that by leaving, they could almost show that principal or that school that they didn't have to stay there. They were out of there and going somewhere else. I want to talk about another player in this equation, and that is the virtual schools, which your research found are responsible for almost all of the students who leave during the summer break or mid-year. What's motivating them to make that switch? A lot of students are switching into virtual schools for the same reasons they switch to other choice programs. They're looking for something different. What we found was that 40% of kids who are entering virtual schools aren't staying there. They're dropping out. They're going to private programs, so we don't know where they went, or they're just falling back into the public school system. I'd like to qualify this by saying there's lots of kids who have special circumstances for whom virtual schools are a terrific option. I probably would have taken advantage of it myself as a high school student, but we found lots of kids based on their scores who were not performing very well in public schools for one reason or another. They switched to a virtual school and there were significant drops in math scores for switchers into virtual schools. And there were also drops in math scores for kids who switched out of virtual schools into public schools, but that drop was a little bit smaller. There's definitely more negative impact for kids who switched into a virtual school. There have certainly been questions raised about the overall quality of virtual schools. We should talk about the fact that we're not making a blanket statement here and there are pockets of excellence in this sector of the industry, just like everywhere. But what about the quality and performance of the virtual schools in Wisconsin relative to traditional public schools? Most of them have much lower graduation rates. Their report cards are not very strong. As a matter of fact, Virtual schools have pushed to be separated from the district or districts have asked for the virtual schools to be separated from their overall district report card scores because they don't want those lower scores to drop down their district average. So there's definitely been movement around there. The outcomes are not great. When you ask virtual school leaders about them, they say, look, you know, we're we're often getting kids who are already not performing well. It's the fault of their traditional schools who aren't serving these students, and we're simply picking them up and trying to help them along. What are some of the solutions that are being floated for addressing churn? And I'm also curious specifically how the school choice community is responding here. You know, it's funny. The school choice community has really risen up and said, well, everybody's risen up and said, thank you for recognizing this problem. This is an issue that crosses sectors. I mean, parents are much less tied to what type of school they're in than, you know, political forces in Milwaukee. So a lot of the leaders in the choice community have joined um, you know, kind of like this ad hoc committee to say, what can we do to raise awareness about the importance of picking a good school and then staying there? And it's been the Milwaukee Public Schools, which just has not really joined the conversation at all, which is curious because it affects so many of their kids. Well, certainly you would hope that everybody would be coming to this big table. Right. Almost all of the school leaders in the city have said, you know, we recognize this negatively impacts all of us. And, you know, it it helps us when our kids stick with us. Now, there's still a fair amount of poaching behind the scenes because kids are dollars and, um, you know, people want to enroll as many kids as possible before enrollment count dates. But there has been a concerted effort from a group that is mostly composed of choice school leaders and other folks in the community who are trying to launch an awareness campaign around the importance of sticking with a school that you choose. What are some story ideas for local reporters who might want to dig into this question of student churn in their own districts? A really good place to start is just by asking your local district, what do you track when it comes to student mobility? And it's really important to ask if they're just tracking within the district mobility or if they're also tracking ins and outs from the district. There's lots of different ways that you can define mobility and turnover and churn. So it's really important to get those definitions right. If they don't have it at all, that's a really good story because you can say, hey, this is kind of a topic that's emerging nationally and, um, you know, this district doesn't know at all how many kids are moving. It's also then really good to see if you can find another district that's similar and also ask for their turnover rates and see 
how you can compare them. You can compare to a national average by um, simply referring to the big national story that we did where we surveyed all states on this. And then even if there isn't a lot of churn, there are stories to be told about stable programs and how, you know, the impact of lots of kids and teachers sticking around from year to year can help drive growth. So those are some of the places I would start. I would encourage everyone to go online and look at Aaron's full package. I'm sure you'll find some inspiration there. You can find that at jsonline forward slash lessons lost. We did want to mention that Erin recently moved on to a new position. She's national education reporter at USA Today. Erin, we're really looking forward to see what you cover from this new vantage point. Thanks. I am too. And thank you, everybody. That wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story you want to know more about, drop us a line. We're at radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, and thanks for listening.